Hi guys, this is Roman Goose, and in this video we're going to be looking at the guitars of Gary Moore. So Gary Moore was born on the 4th of April 1952, and he was raised in Belfast, Ireland. Gary Moore's greatest influence in his early days was guitarist Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac. Other early musical influences were artists such as The Beatles, Albert King, Elvis Presley, and The Beatles. Gary states, The first guitar I ever had was a Framus. German made. That was when I was 10 years old. My father brought it home. A friend of his was selling it and I bought it for five pounds. It was a big cello bodied guitar with two F holes. It looked huge next to me. After that, I had a Lucky Squire made by Rosetti, an Italian company. That was a horrible guitar as well. Once when I was playing it in a club, the whole back fell off. I couldn't afford any guitar, not even the Italian ones. Later, I got a Vox Clubman that had a socket like a TV antenna. It was really weird. When I was 14 or 15, I got a Telecaster, my first proper guitar. There were only three coming into Belfast and I got the last one. I joined Skid Row when I was 16 and still had the Telecaster for quite a while. After about six months, I got a Gibson SG. So as Gary stated, he acquired a standard right-handed Fender Telecaster at the age of 14. And he learned to play this instrument even though he was left-handed in the right-handed fashion. Gary Moore also mentioned his Telecaster when remembering Rory Gallagher. He remembered Gallagher from the Club Rado days. And Gary states, We didn't have any spare strings between us, and he used to leave his guitar on stage for me if I broke a string. And I'd leave my Telecaster for him if he broke a string. There was a nice vibe between us. Gary had persuaded his dad to buy the Telecaster on credit but only under the condition that he joined a horrible band called Dave and the Diamonds. Gary's dad would still be paying for that guitar two years after he'd left home. Later, Gary paid his dad back. After this, Gary moved on to form his own blues band, a trio called Platform 3. Before that, Gary played in a band called The Beat Boys at his father's club in Hollywood outside Belfast. His dad paid 180 guineas for this white Telecaster. Gary used the Telecaster when he joined the group Skid Row in 1968. Another guitar that Gary Moore used in Skid Row was a 1952 Gibson Les Paul. Obviously this would have started life as a gold top, but here you can see that it's a red sunburst. The pickups on this guitar were P90s with black plastic covers and also a matching toggle switch cover. The guitar was also fitted with three 50s barrel knobs and one reflector knob. This guitar featured a gold tunematic bridge and a trapeze tailpiece. The previous owner of this guitar was Robin Trower of Procol Harum, and here you can see him playing it here, although in the bridge position there is a humbucker fitted. In 1973, Gary Moore told a fan that his Gibson Les Paul was stolen. Guys, I would really recommend checking out some of Gary Moore's work with Skid Row, especially with this Les Paul, because you can really hear him developing his sort of later Les Paul style on this guitar. So guys, here's a photo of Skid Row at the Tabba Club on 3rd of July, 1970. So according to the previous statement about Gary's Les Paul being stolen, this would mean that the Les Paul was stolen before July 1970, and he used the SG as his main guitar after this date. Judging by the photo of this SG guitar, it would probably be a 1967 or 1968 SG special guitar. You can tell this by the skinny nut width and also the full size scratch plate with P90 pickups. As you can see, it also has three small holes by the bridge and this would have probably accommodated a Maestro Vibralo originally. Gary used his guitar towards the end of his period with Skid Row. When asked what bands influenced Skid Row, he replied, Cream and Hendrix, but we also like King Crimson and other syncopated technical type bands. The bass player was one of those guys who liked to show off a lot, so he was trying to make the band impressive by writing lots of difficult riffs, lots of fast, syncopated stuff where we really were playing in unison with the drummer. We were also writing some of our own American West Coast stuff like The Birds or Sky Pilot by Eric Burden and the Animals. Phil Linnett was actually in the band, so we had a lead singer before we became a three-piece. In the early 70s, Skid Row relocated to London. In 1972, Gary also started performing as the Gary Moore Band. And it was also in 1972 that Gary met up with his hero and friend again at the Marquee Club in London. This, of course, was Peter Green. And let's hear what Gary has to say about that meeting. 
Basically, he left Fleetwood Mac, and not long after, I got to know him. In fact, I was in the Marquee Club one night in London, and he said, would you like to borrow my guitar? And I said, wow, I'd love to borrow your guitar. It was my dream guitar, having seen him play with John Mayall and everything, and Fleetwood Mac with that guitar. To me, that was the ultimate guitar. So I went back to his parents' house the next day and picked it up. And I kept it for a few days in my little bedsit flat in North London. And I fell in love with it, obviously, over those next few days. And he called me up and he said, well, what do you think of that guitar? And I said, oh, it's amazing. And he goes, well, do you want it? And I said, well, I can't afford that guitar. Are you crazy? And he says, well, you sell your guitar and whatever you get for it, you give me and it'll be like swapping axes. That was the way he put it. I remember exactly how he said it. And so I had an SG and I sold it for £140 or something. And he kind of took most of that loot, gave me some back and said, no, I'm going to just take what I paid for it, which was £110 or £120, something like that, which was ridiculous, you know, at the time. But I said to him, because I knew he wasn't in a very good frame of mind at the time, I said, if you ever want it back, just tell me and you can have it back. And he said, no, I'll never ask for it back. I just want it to have a good home. So he's never asked me for it back. That was like in the early 70s. So I've had it ever since. So guys, check out this photo here. This could quite possibly be the first sighting of Gary Moore with the Greeny Les Paul, probably taking it in 1972. Let's hear Gary talking about the case that the guitar came in. He even had the case off the one from the Blues Breakers that Eric had stolen. And I had that case on the guitar for a long time. And then that disappeared as well. So I had the case from the Blues Breakers one and the case from a hard road, which isn't bad. You can see the Blues Breakers case on the back cover of Back on the Streets, the solo album recorded by Gary Moore in 1978. Gary uses as his main guitar exclusively until the late 70s. It can be heard on his first two solo albums, Grinding Stone, released in 1973, and Back on the Streets from 1978. And also in his work um, with Thin Lizzy, which started in 1973, and on Coliseum 2. In this photo from 1978, you can see that Gary has made a few alterations to the guitar. The original vintage bridge was changed for a nearly identical reissue ABR1 model. And the tuning pegs were replaced by nickel plated spursals. Also, the original plastic guitar jack socket plate was replaced with a metal one. And the two bottom control knobs were replaced with 60s style reflector knobs. But guys, check out in this photo also that Gary has reversed the pickup so that now the pole pieces are facing the neck and not the bridge as Peter Green had it originally. Gary said of this guitar, Back in 72, that guitar went everywhere with me. You wouldn't believe it. At the time, I lived in a dodgy bedsit in Belsize Park with no locks on the doors, so I couldn't leave it there. I used to sleep with the guitar under my bed, and if I went to the pictures, I'd take the guitar with me. I remember once that the police stopped me and took me to the station, then searched my guitar case for drugs. When I got it back, the handle had disappeared. So from then on, I had to walk around with the case cradled in my arms. So at 19 years old, I would be walking around with Peter Green's old guitar in Eric Clapton's old case with no handle and held together by tour stickers. Pretty scary. At some point, probably during the 1980s, Gary's car was struck from behind by a lorry. And Greeny, as Gary Moore named the guitar, was broken in half. Guitar repairman in London, Charlie Chandler, then handled the quite extensive repairs. There were cracks through the body and the neck joint, along with two breaks in the neck. Charlie had to remove the pickups during the repair and also take the covers off the pickups to check them. It's interesting to note that he clearly saw that the neck pickup had been rewound with heavy four var wire, which had a grey coax hookup cable, which originally was modified by guitar luthier Sam Lee for Peter Green. Charlie has stated that virtually all the electronics and wiring has been replaced at some time or other. And Charlie even said that it had push pull pots at one point. If you haven't already guys, check out the album Blues for Greeny, which was released in 1995, because Gary used the Greeny Les Paul on the entire album. As the years went on, Gary preferred to play another Les Paul, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Gary eventually sold this guitar around the mid 2000s. And guys, I would definitely check out the video previous to this one and you can find out exactly why he sold this guitar. In 1975, Gary Moore and John Heisman decided to start a band called Coliseum 2. 
Whilst most of the live recordings and performances feature the grainy Les Paul, here we can see Gary with a Stratocaster which appears to be white in colour. This photo was from 1977. In an interview for Beat Instrumental in January 1979, Gary Moore states, I've got another Stratocaster which I'm having completely rebuilt. I broke the neck off whilst having a row with me chick. So I've got the body of the guitar and I'm having a new neck built for it. I'm having a DiMatteo put on it. I also have the real heavy modified tremolo unit with a heavier bracket so you can't break it off so easily. Gary was first seen using this modified guitar on December the 20th, 1978 at the Stardust nightclub in Dublin whilst performing with the Greedy Bastards, a band consisting of the whole of Thin Lizzy lineup and two Six Pistol members, Paul Cook and Steve Jones. You can see Gary using this strat whilst performing with Thin Lizzy on Top of the Pops and also during the 1979 Black Rose Tour. As you can see from the photos, the finish has been taken off the body and the scratch plate has been modified to accommodate the two DiMarzio humbucking pickups. Okay, here's Gary with a 1960 Gibson Melody Maker. This guitar was mainly used for live work around the mid to late 70s with Thin Lizzy. Gary changed the original pickup to a white DiMarzio Super Distortion pickup. This next guitar is a 1955 Gibson Les Paul Jr. Gary can be seen using this guitar during Thin Lizzy's 1979 Black Rose Tour. Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols sold Gary the guitar. Gary most likely acquired this guitar between mid to late 1978. He used it on stage a number of times with Steve and the Greedy Bastards. Here's Gary playing in Thin Lizzy in 1979. And this guitar is a peat back made firebird type guitar. And you can see what probably looks like a DiMarzio pickup in the neck position. Okay, this next guitar is a 1980 Charvel Custom. Gary received this guitar just before recording the G-Force album in 1980. Shortly after leaving Thin Lizzy during the band's US tour in 1979, Gary travelled to Los Angeles to develop as a solo artist. He ended up forming a band called G-Force. At the same time, he went to visit Charvel. Grover gave the first guitar to Gary during rehearsals for the recording of the album. Gary changed the strings to a heavier set that he was used to and played with the guitar for the first time. His Charvel featured metallic red-pink finish on a Strat-shaped body, a rosewood fretboard, two humbuckers, and a Kayla 2300 series tremolo. It's quite likely that Gary used this guitar during most of the recording for the G-Force album. There's not a lot of footage of him using it live. You can see it in these photos of his guitar collection, which was taken sometime in the 1980s. This next guitar is a 1961 Fender Stratocaster. Gary started using this Strat in the early 80s with Greg Lake as his main tremolo guitar. The Strat turned up as a result of a shopping trip that Gary and Greg Lake made to Kensington in South London one day. We found it in a shop called John King's, Gary remembers. Greg tried it out, but he didn't like it because it had a few scratches on it. He likes his guitars to be really immaculate. I said, well, you're not gonna get one like this that is immaculate. They stopped making them in 1962. And on most of them, the paint's worn off so you can't get this particular colour anymore. I said, if you don't want it, I'll have it. Gary says of this Strat, it's the best Strat I've ever played. When he received the guitar, he didn't play it for about six months as it needed a good reworking and most notably a refretting. It's been his longest running Stratocaster and one of his oldest guitars overall since he used it on some of his later gigs as well, including the 2005 The Strat Pack concert, which marks the 50th anniversary of the Fender Stratocaster guitar. The guitar's previous owner was Tommy Steele, an English singer popular in the late 50s. It has a salmon pink finish. The only thing that Gary has changed on this guitar are the frets, which he replaced with Jim Dunlop jumbo frets. This guitar was actually lost in 1984 when Gary traveled to the US to do a tour there. Somebody in British customs tried to steal it, but soon changed their mind after finding out whose guitar it was. The guitar then arrived at Interpol in Houston halfway through Gary's US tour. Gary uses three springs on all his Stratocasters. Gary replaced the middle pickup with the same old Duncan Antiquity. Later on he used his guitar on the Power of the Blues album in 2004 and also on parts of Old New Ballads Blues, Close As You Get and Bad For You Baby. This next guitar is a 1980 Charvel Custom Leopard. Gary can first be seen with this guitar around 1980, as can be seen here on this photo shoot. 
This, of course, was a Charvel made by Grover Jackson and was one of the first that Gary received. The custom paint job featured a leopard pattern. It featured two humbuckers, which were most likely DiMatteo, with an X2N in the bridge position. It had a maple neck and a transparent plastic pickguard. Gary says about this guitar, A joke, really. I used the Charvels from time to time, but I've made up my mind that what I want to do now is buy another old Strat and just take that on the road as a spare for the pink Strat because I've been using the Charvels as spares for the Strat, which is really wrong. I have my equipment set up for the Strat tone-wise and you plug it in a Charvel and it's a lot more powerful. They've got all kinds of shit on them. Damasio, same on Duncan's. Just because they're humbuckers, they're a lot more powerful. So you have to turn and run and switch all your tones around and mess it all up. You haven't got time to do that really, so you end up with a bad sounding guitar on two or three songs. I'd rather have another Strat, plug it straight in. This next guitar is a 1980s Fender Stratocaster 62 reissue. Gary purchased this guitar in mid-1984 to replace his 61 Stratocaster, which was stolen a couple of days before this. So this was the guitar that was used for most of the 1984 US tour. And although he got his 61 Stratocaster returned, he preferred to use this reissue as he had gotten used to it for the rest of the US tour. Gary has stated that he owned two of these reissue guitars. In the early 1980s, Gary received two Charvel guitars. These guitars were both modified by his guitar tech, Keith Page. This red guitar was originally a direct Stratocaster replica with an addition of a Floyd Rose tremolo and a lock and nut. But sometime in 1986, Keith Page, Gary's guitar tech, took out the three single coil pickups and installed a single EMG81 in the bridge position. The pickguard, of course, was also replaced. The empty pickup cavity was used to house a 9 volt battery for the EMG pickup. Gary used this guitar from around 1986 to 1989. And here is the second of the two Charvels. This guitar is mainly known for it being featured on the cover of the Dirty Fingers album released in 1983. Originally, this guitar featured a black pickguard and two full-size humbuckers. However, in 1986, Keith Page took out the humbuckers and installed a single EMG 81 active pickup in the bridge position. He also installed a white single-ply Stratocaster pickguard. This guitar featured a Floyd Rose tremolo and a maple neck. Around the late 1980s, the neck was replaced with a Jackson replacement neck with a rosewood fretboard. And this guitar was used extensively during the 1989 After the War tour. Prior to this, Gary used this guitar from 86 to 88 as one of his main tremolo guitars. This next guitar is a 1984 Hamer Explorer. This guitar was completed and shipped to Gary Moore on the 30th of July, 1984. It features a natural finish on a flame maple top two humbuckers and a stop tailpiece. This next guitar is a 1980s Hamer Special. Gary can be seen using this guitar for the first time in 1985. And this photo is from a gig played with Phil Linnett that year on a Channel 4 ECT show. This guitar was made especially for Gary and it is mildly based on a mid 80s Hamer Special model. Its features are a white finish on a mahogany body, two DiMaggio humbuckers, a 22 fret mahogany neck with a rosewood fingerboard and a Floyd Rose tremolo. This guitar was featured on their 1985 album, Run For Cover. Gary Moore owned two of these guitars. Also, Hamer planned a Gary Moore model, which was conceived based on the Phantom in 1984. However, it did not make it to production, although Gary owned two of these himself. Asked in 1987 about Hamer guitars, Gary replies, a few years ago, after I discovered the Charvels, it was a great experience getting acquainted with Hamer guitars. I wrote the album Run For Cover with these guitars, for example. They're based on the same principle as the old Les Paul Jr. I don't have any advertising deal with Hamer. At the time, I visited the factory in Chicago. I said to Paul Hamer, the best I can do is just play your guitar. I didn't want any money for it, because when I play a guitar, I just like it. This next guitar is a 1980s Ibanez Roadstar to RS-1000. In 1984, Gary became an official Ibanez guitar in Dorsey. He was often seen with this Cherry Sunburst RS-1000 model. This guitar featured an older body with a bird's eye maple top. The guitar came with two Maxon Super 58 humbucker pickups and a hard rocker pro tremolo bridge. 
The RS-1000 was produced from around 1981 and at the time was one of the top of the line models. Along with this Ibanez model, he used a metallic grey Roadstar 2 and a custom Roadstar 2 in black. This guitar was most famously used for the song Out in the Fields with Phil Linnett in 1985. The guitar is an RS-530 model and it featured a flat top with red body bindings, a 24 fret neck, a pro rock tremolo bridge and standard passive Ibanez pickups. He can also be seen here with an Ibanez artist model. This next guitar is a 1986 Jackson soloist and was made especially for Gary Moore following his specs. He used it on his album Wild Frontier released in 1987. This guitar can be heard on the songs Over the Hills and Far Away, Friday on My Mind and The Loner. He also toured with this guitar for the concerts that followed the album's release. These were Jackson made pickups. The Floyd Rose licensed Jackson vibrato is an early version without a cavity behind it. Therefore notes cannot be pulled too sharp but the vibrations of the strings are more fully transmitted into the body. Other features include the shark fin inlays on the fretboard. Here is Gary with a 1950s Gibson ES5 and this guitar was featured on the cover of the 1987 album Wild Frontier. Gary received it as a present from Greg Lake whom he'd worked with previously on Greg's solo album. The guitar is most likely an early to mid 50s pre Switchmaster model featuring blonde finish and three P90 pickups. Gary said of this guitar, I've got some very nice Gibsons like a 1955 ES5 which is like a full bodied blonde jazz guitar which I bought from Greg Lake when I was working with him. This next guitar is a 1980s Hamer Vector which Gary got in the mid 1980s. You can see this guitar on the music video Ready for Love released in 1989. This guitar was made from 1982 until 1985. And this photo here is from the booklet from the Empty Rooms Summer 1985 version of vinyl. The guitar was finished in light blue and featured a single humbucker in the bridge position. And this was probably a DiMaggio or a Slammer pickup. Here is Gary with a synth axe. Let's hear what Gary has to say about this. The company came to me and asked my opinion of the design and I gave them a few suggestions. The thing is, the triggering is not what it should be at the moment, although I believe they're bringing out new software to improve that. The strings in the right hand don't actually connect to the ones on the fretboard. It feels pretty funny if you're a guitarist. It's really a separate instrument. Gary used this guitar on the video for Out in the Fields released in 1985. It was created in the mid 80s by Bill Atkin, Mike Dixon and Tony Sedevi in joint venture funded by Richard Branton, but only 100 units were ever made. Ok guys, let's talk about PRS guitars. In total, Gary owned three PRS guitars in the late 80s. He had a white PRS Custom 24 and an orange Standard 24, both of which can be seen in the Wild Frontier music video. He also owned a blue PRS seen in Over the Hills and Far Away. The guitar featured here in the music video for Ferry Aid featured a 24 fret neck with dot inlays and also has an EMG 81 active pickup in the bridge and a classic humbucker in the neck position. This guitar is a Heritage CM150 guitar which was a prototype for a future Gary Moore model. It features a PJ Marks in the neck and an EMG 81 in the bridge. Gary owned two of the signature models for him to keep and play. During this time he also owned an H140CM which he used in the studio on the After the War album. Furthermore he owned three H150 guitars. He was photographed for the resulting cover shot for the After the War album with his number one signature model which was the first one of the Burst series. He used one of the Heritage GM signature models at a concert at Hammersmith Odeon. Gary would only authorise 75 guitars in total of his signature model. However, Japan ordered 50 of the first batch and the UK distributor wanted 40. So Gary was approached by Heritage to authorise another 75 guitars and he reluctantly agreed. These were released in a different colour. The first 75 were released in amber and the second batch were released in almond burst which was actually Gary's original choice. This next guitar is a 1959 Gibson Les Paul Standard and this guitar is also known as Stripe. The guitar was purchased on behalf of Gary by his guitar tech Graham Lilly in 1988. 
The previous owner was Phil Harris, who came to the studio one day where Gary was rehearsing and offered him two of his guitars. Gary ended up with this light burst, worn out 1959 Les Paul Standard. Gary says about this guitar, I've had it since 1989 and I use it live a lot. It's not pristine by any means, but it's a really great guitar and I've used it on a lot of albums since Still Got The Blues. In fact, Still Got The Blues was the first track it was used on. That's the first song we did that day and I thought it was a good indicator of what the guitar could do. I've used it ever since. The guitar has mostly been unmodified except for the tuners which were replaced with Grovers. And Charlie Chandler, the guitar repairman in London, replaced the original frets with Dunlop jumbo frets. Here is a picture of Stripe in its original condition and here you can see the two nickel cover plates on the pickups. Another thing to note about this guitar is you can see the neck pickup has been reversed so that the screws are pointing towards the bridge. Here is Gary with the 1958 Gibson Les Paul. This Les Paul was used for all of Gary's after hours CD photo shoot. It was also used on two of Gary Moore's videos, Cold Day in Hell and Since I Met You Baby. Gary purchased this guitar in 1991. Gary had this to say about his 58 Les Paul, although he misidentifies it as a 59. I had another 59 that I sold in the 90s and that one sounded like rubbish. It's the one that's on the cover of the After Hours album. It sounded very flat and dull and was probably the worst sounding one I'd come across in a long time. This guitar is a 1968 Fender Telecaster. Gary got this guitar sometime in 1990 and has mainly used this for his slide work. You can hear this guitar on the recordings of Moving On from the 1990 album Still Got The Blues. This guitar was tuned to an open A. You can also hear it on the song If The Devil Made Whiskey from Gary's 2007 album. The guitar features a blonde finish and two original Fender single coil pickups fitted on a black pickguard. The original 68 maple neck was replaced by the previous owner with a later rosewood model. This next guitar is a 1990s Fritz Brothers Super Deluxe guitar. Gary used this guitar at the Marquee Club in London in 1992, especially on the song The Sky's Crying. As you can see, this guitar featured a light blue finish. It has a 25.5 scale length, solid Stitka spruce top, an ebony fretboard, three custom wound single coil pickups, and spurs or locking tuners. This is a 1964 Gibson Firebird 1 guitar. Gary bought this in 1994 for the BBM project. It's a reverse mahogany body with a sunburst finish and a replacement Seymour Duncan mini humbucker in the bridge pickup and also came with the original banjo tuners. This guitar was sold at auction in 2016 for £10,625. Here is Gary with his 1962 Gibson ES355. Gary talks about this guitar in 1997. I got it about 18 months ago and the six way varia tone switch isn't wired in so it's like a 335 really. A few rock guitarists would be really surprised if they picked one up. They sound amazing but I suppose they haven't got the right image. Gary can be seen using this guitar during the live at Montreux show recorded in 1997 on the song One Good Reason. Here is a 1990s Fender Stratocaster HSS. Gary used it on his Dark Days in Paradise tour in 1997 as his main tremolo guitar. It can also be heard on the Dark Days in Paradise album on the tracks I Have Found My Love In You and Like Angels. The American built guitar featured a humbucker in the bridge and a Floyd Rose tremolo installed in the place of a standard Fender tremolo. As you can see it has a black finish and has a maple neck. This photo here is Gary with a 1961 Gibson SG and alongside him is Jack Bruce. He worked with Jack on a 1998 instructional film entitled The Cream of Cream. This video also featured the great British drummer Gary Husband. Notice the screw holes by the strap end that would indicate that a sideways vibrola was originally fitted and removed. Gary sounds really great playing this guitar, so I'm gonna put a link of this video down in the description. This guitar is a 1963 Fender Stratocaster, whose paint, most likely a three-tone sunburst, has been stripped for a natural look. This guitar was gifted to Gary Moore by Claude Nobbs in 1998. Nobbs, otherwise known as Funky Claude, is none other than the founder of the Montreal Jazz Festival. And Gary has played at the festival seven times between 1990 and 2010. And Claude gave this to Gary as a present. Not only was the paint removed, but also the tuners, the vibrato, the frets, and the pickups were all replaced. The pickups were replaced with a set of Kinmans, 
he would always take this guitar on tour as a backup for his 1961 Fender Stratocaster. You can hear Gary playing this guitar on the DVD Blues for Jimmy, especially on the spellbinding version of the Slow Blues Red House. Although over the years there was various Gary Moore signature models, probably the most famous model associated with Gary is the Gibson Gary Moore signature Les Paul. Although based on a 1959 standard, it did feature various differences. The body was finished in amber burst and the neck featured the same profile as a 1959 guitar, but it had no binding on the body or the neck. The pickups were newly developed burst bucket pickups, although Gary's main guitar was actually a prototype which featured Tom Holmes pickups instead. Gary would have used these guitars from 2001 onwards. The production guitars featured a neck pickup which was reversed in its mounting, in recognition of a similar modification to the Peter Green Les Paul. It also came with mismatched amber and gold top hat knobs on the neck and bridge pickup controls. Here is Gary with the Gibson Les Paul double cut. Gary can be seen playing this guitar at the Montreal concert in 2001 for the song The Prophet. It's essentially a Gibson Les Paul guitar with a double cutaway, 24 frets and only one control knob for volume and one control knob for tone. Gary owned three Gibson Explorer reissue guitars which he purchased in 2002. At the time he was working on the Scars project and he bought the three guitars in view of using them live for the Scars album. This Red Explorer was used on three tracks off of the Power of the Blues album in 2004. This White Explorer was used during the Monsters of Rock concert in Sheffield in 2003. Here is a 1963 Gibson ES335. The guitar was bought from Johnny Fien, Gary's old friend and a guitarist of the Irish band Horse Lips. Gary used the guitar on Back to the Blues album release on 2001, which also featured this guitar on the cover photo. He used it on the song Have You Heard from the 2007 album Close As You Get. Gary said about the guitar, On Have You Heard I used a 335. I think it's a 1964. It has PAF pickups in it and sounds a bit like a Les Paul. Here's Gary with a beautiful red Gibson Firebird. He got this guitar in 2005. You can see him performing live on stage with this guitar. He used this guitar completely stock with two mini humbuckers and a fixed bridge. When being interviewed and asked about the Preacher Man Blues track, Gary Moore says, That thin, hard sound is a red Gibson Firebird I picked up in Finland last year. That guitar has a nice twang to it, and it really brings out the twang from the spring reverb. Here is a Gibson 57 Gold Top reissue used during the AVO sessions in 2008. This guitar is a reissue of a 57 Les Paul Gold Top, and it came with custom bucker pickups. Along with the reissue Gold Top, Gary also used several 58-59 standard reissues. Two of these guitars were used during the last film performance at Montreal Jazz Festival on the 6th of July 2010, but they were also seen on some earlier gigs around 2007. One of the reissues was this 2001 58 reissue. This guitar was featured for the promo pictures for the Bad For You Baby album cover. Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you haven't. And we're going to be back with some more really cool videos very soon. Take care. God bless.